BU Amsterdam, we are part of an international movement, a new term to environmental humanities. It's a great privilege to be with you as you launch your new centre. Thank you particularly to Schurd Kluving and Christine Stender for hosting me here. Uh, I've been actively involved in several interesting initiatives in ecological and environmental humanities at the Australian National University, that's Schurd mentioned, at the KTH Environmental Humanities Lab in Sweden and the Rachel Carson Centre in Germany. I'm also a founding member of the Museums and Climate Change Network, which we set up in New York. Um, and we have a book just out that's getting a free plug up there. Uh, what's striking... Oh, I don't think I need that. What's striking is the breadth of the work and how it reaches beyond the ivory tower to public spaces, museums, to intergenerational partnerships, and the international partnerships that are fostered by this new turn in scholarship. Here are just a few of the initiatives that I know about. I'm sure there are lots of other ones. Uh, as you can see, every place and centre has its own focus, its own style, its own tone. It has different disciplinary mixes, different theorising and different practice. Yet, there are some commonalities. First, the timing. Why? This convergence on the new discourse of the environmental humanities. The idea of the age of humans has triggered many of these discussions, both theoretically and practically. So I'll begin with a reflection on the role of the environmental humanities in conversations about the Anthropocene, which is how I first met Sher. <laughs> I will then briefly share with you some of the practical international initiatives from elsewhere that I know about. Not to prescribe, but just to sketch the breadth of the field and what might be achieved within and beyond universities in the public intellectual space. Finally, I will comment on the particular strengths of Amsterdam uh, as a place for such an initiative. I'm just an outsider, I don't speak Dutch, I've only visited your beautiful city twice before, but I just think this place is this is a great initiative for this place. So let me first begin with this question of now. Why now for the environmental humanities? There's no doubt that this is the right time. The environmental humanities is coming of age. No one thinks that the environment is something that is just science or just nature anymore. What you decide to do with the environmental humanities here, of course, will depend on your local strengths and partnerships. But we have a special opportunity in the age of humans. The new epoch of the Anthropocene was originally proposed not by stratigraphers, people who make the decisions about the stratigraphic order of the Earth, but rather by Paul Crutzen, the Dutch atmospheric chemist, who first became famous for his work on the ozone layer and by the 1980s was concerned about changes in the atmosphere that created global warming. He was part of an interdisciplinary team of Earth system scientists working with the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, that's IGBP, everybody calls it. Let's do this. They were collecting data and synthesising research across many disciplines that would assist the workings of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. <laughs> trying to put the acronym and also the full thing is takes me. Crutzen's insight was that the Earth system was changing in many different ways. This was more than climate change. It was atmospheric, it wasn't just atmospheric change, but also exponential changes in the oceans, across the lands, in cities, in deserts. Together, the hockey stick curves suggested that the whole Earth system was changing, possibly suddenly, sharply, unexpectedly. Many of these changes were caused by human activities. Together, their cumulative effect and interactions were taking the Earth beyond the ways the Earth had known to work in the past. Stop talking about the Holocene, he said. We're in a new epoch, the, 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 the Anthropocene. <laughs> And we actually have a, um, a really nice piece by Will, Will Stephan um, in that book, The Future of Nature, Documents of Global Change, 
which includes uh, one of my co-editors is Gaffa Celine, who you quoted, so there we are, there's the connection. It's all connected. <laughs> Much of the discussion around the Anthropocene in scientific circles has been around when it began. Was it the agricultural or the industrial revolution that triggered it? These discussions revolve around whose data is crucial. What starting point makes most sense, particularly for the International Stratigraphic Commission, which must rule on whether the epoch is admissible? However, there's something more urgent happening even as this deliberation is going on. Most of the IGBP group quickly agree that whatever the starting point, there is a new rate of change in our own era from about 1950. Actually, it's called the Great Acceleration and most of, of today's world leaders were born in it. So it, we're just talking about the people on Earth now, affecting the Earth in every age. This is, this is John McNeil, who actually came up with the term the Great Acceleration. This sense of a great acceleration of change is something widely felt by people beyond the sciences. The changes in human populations, in wealth, in globalisation, in public health since 1950 have all, all, all travelled lockstep with those scientific hockey stick curves. They're all the same shape and curve and they all start about 1950 and go up exponentially. The sense of crisis of environmental change everywhere all at once has made the Anthropocene not just an, a geological epoch, but also a meme, a concept that stimulated art, literature and public activities, particularly in the Western world where these changes began. Jamie Lorimer, who's a UK geographer, in a new paper this, online this week, talks about the Anthropocene and how the concept has been constructive for academics, policy makers and artists, and partnerships between them. In particular, he explores the Anthropocene as a trans-contextual concept. It's proliferated promiscuously in ways unforeseen by its creators. And he traces five different ways the scene is constructed by the Anthropocene, through traditional and unexpected praxis. The first is the scientific question, and that's what we hear all about. What will the Anthropocene Working Group persuade the Stratigraphic Commission to do? And that's the political and aesthetic context, context for them. But the second, the intellectual zeitgeist, I think is of real interest to people like us. It's the spirit of our times. It's a plastic and catchy label for a common curiosity and anxiety about the state and future of the Earth after the end of nature, Lorimer says. It's also an ideological provocation. It, it includes questions of should there be a good Anthropocene, planetary stewardship, new ontologies for environmentalism, including questions about the human domination of environmental outcomes. And the final uh, category, science fiction, by which Lorimer means not just cli-fi narratives and the sorts of novels under scrutiny by echo critics, but rather what the chair of the Anthropocene Working Group, uh, Jan Zalachevich, argues in this popular book, The Earth After Us. Zalachevich points to the fictional art of imagining what might be definitive fossil evidence for an epoch several million years into the future. It's a totally imaginative thing. It is fiction. He considers such anthropogenic indicators that leave traces in the rocks as concrete in mega cities, which when you were driving around Amsterdam, you certainly see piles of rubble everywhere. And the idea that they might be squashed and make a little line in the rocks in the future is the sort of thought. <laughs> what about plastics floating in the sea? A whole continent of them eventually wash up on the shoreline, and maybe there'll be a line of those in the rocks in the future. The one that's looking most likely is the traces of nuclear activity, evident in rocket assemblages laid down since the bomb. Archaeologists already use those, and geomorphologists, uh, to, to date, if, if you get a particular lithium iron, it has to be since 1953, because that's when that was released into the atmosphere first. It's very useful for trying to work out um, soil degra degradation in Australia, I know. So, 
Geologists are not the only ones with legacy anxiety. Literary scholar Robert McFarlane recently joined the fray. He said, what will survive of us is love, wrote poet Philip Larkin. Wrong. What will survive of us is plastic. <laughs> and then 207, the stable isotope at the end of the uranium-235 decay. Whatever stratigraphers decide, the Anthropocene genie is out of the bottle, and it's already doing important public and ethical work. I put up this slide not to ask you to read it, <laughs> but this is a, a, just a list of the Anthropocene events that I know of, which is, so it's going to be in English because my other languages are not that strong. And the one at the top in yellow is the Geological Society, that's the Anthropocene and Hillary Pop, May 2011. But almost none of the others are scientific at all. There's one about bats in the Anthropocene in Berlin, but as you go down the list, the water in the Anthropocene, Global Water Systems Project involved, uh, but gradually you start seeing a lot of museums in there. And in fact, by the 2015, where I've got some I've uh, got a little bit bigger. There's a lot of art, energy cultures in the Anthropocene. That was the Oberman College Humanities uh, Symposium at the University of Iowa. Uh, and the postgraduates are leading some of these things. I've put that one in the um, Association for the Study for Literature and Environment, which I know Christine's a member of. Mm -hmm. They had a postgraduate event on a change of scene where they put the S in brackets, as in Anthropocene versus Holocene, but also the Lauren joke. So I think that, that that's all happening. So I'm just, the people who are worrying about this are not all scientists, and it's not about an epoch anymore. It's about um, a time. Mike Hume, the ge geographer and climate scientist, has written about the importance of not reducing the future to climate. The motivation for talking about a multifactorial change in an epoch is exactly this for climate scientists. It's not an issue to fix climate change, but rather to frame global warming as a product of multiple causes. And Hume and Crutzen and other Earth System <coughs> scientists are adamant that the human sciences are part of this mix. We're looking for scholarship for weird futures. Uh, this is a, a slide of various things. Um, Overland is a literary journal in Australia with Slow Down World on the cover. This one you may not be familiar with the language, it's uh, Estonian. They have a new uh, their uh, public journal. The Anthropocene Review, one of the scholarly journals. Smithsonian is doing an exhibition about the, uh, the uh, Anthropocene and their, the future is here is, is an advertisement about that. And the one at the top, if you want to read about the, or do a little YouTube video, Welcome to the Anthropocene is the original group. They, they have that one. While energy transitions are helpful in reducing greenhouse gas pollution, framing the problem of two degree, as two degrees of climate change suggests that there's a singular solution, that the climate change can be fixed. Yet it's probably already impossible to reverse the climatic changes already in train, even to mitigate them very much. Rather, we need ways to make sure that the unpleasant changes do not continue to accelerate, do not um, adversely affect the poor, Climate justice is the term. In these troubled times, humanity must learn to live with novel ecosystems, with more uncertain and variable climates, and with more extreme events, with new conditions not previously encountered in the whole of the Holocene, the epoch during which most world civilizations began. I say most, and a lot of people say all. The Australian Aboriginal civilization, which is continuous, dates to 60,000 years ago, so from before the Holocene. We're now looking for ways to stay with the trouble. This means we need ways to have conversations about moral and responsible ways to live in troubled times. To not talk just about probable futures, but also about justice and possible futures. These discussions are on a fine scale, a human scale, not just a generalised planetary rhetoric. And that's where the humanities come in. The environmental humanities demand transcending the traditions of humanities faculties to work as solo and disciplinary researchers 
The environmental crisis of our times need to work across and between disciplines, especially we need ways to cross the intellectual barriers between the ways we understand nature and the ways we understand people. In the era of anthropogenic change, as Deepesh Chakrabarti puts us, there is no longer a distinction between <coughs> human history and natural history. The challenge is to develop methods and modes of operation to enable team research between humanities, scholars and beyond that reaches out and includes science and the general public. Environmental humanities have already begun to ena enable new collaborations between artists and scientists, between museums and researchers, and between scholars and activists. I'm a historian of science by training, so I have a background in the solo book writing type of humanity, humanists. But I also research <coughs> the teamwork of science and document the historical shift of style from the, the solo thinker, for example, Charles Darwin, mid-19th century, through to the discordant harmonies of big ecology and the digital revolution. So I had to look at the history of science in, and how it works very, very differently in large teams from individuals. And we, we're beginning to do it in the humanities too, and I think it's interesting. So, um, <coughs> We know in the age of biology too, and the question of dangerous climate change is moral, not scientific, uh, Julie, Adne, Julie Adney Thomas argues. So biology was first named a science in 1802, around the same time as the Industrial Revolution that some argue began the Anthropocene. Two centuries later, it's becoming increasingly difficult to distinguish between knowledge about life and other than life. This dualism between the physical sciences and the life sciences that created biology as a discipline makes less and less sense in the hybrid world of the second millennium, populated by Norma Haraway's oncomice and cyborgs. Gigantic entities like global warming, evolution, or the biosphere, to take some of Timothy Morton's examples, are too big and abstract to be seen by any human eye or comprehended by human rules. They can be inferred mathematically and logically, but they're neither life nor not life, nor are they things. He calls them hyper-objects, things that one can compute and think, but neither see nor touch. So they sort of work with your brain, but not with your affective, and that's kind of confusing. In a world of huge hyper-objects, reason itself is no longer a merely humanist endeavour, but rather something larger and more intractable than we'd supposed, Morton says. Like the natural scientists, Morton and other humanists argue that we need a new transdisciplinary conversation to forge alliances. Concepts like nature and environment take on new meanings and demand different understandings. If the distinction between humans and other than humans is porous and the environment is within, and not just around us. Depeche Chakrabarti distinguishes between the globe of Earth system science that has planetary properties and scales, and the globe of globalisation, which is defined by human institutions and imagined using social imaginaries. The global environment is a complex place of many different scales of crisis. The environment was created in the uncertainties of post-war 1940s as a physical space to be man managed and protected as the international world began to feel we were pushing up against our limits. Natural resources were important to rebuilding economies and natural scientists were seen as the ones who had the, the future in their bones. So I put up there Road to Survival by uh, William Fogt, who was a, that was a Jeremiah about we're running out of everything. The man's role in changing the face of the earth, the Princeton Conference in 1955, and the International Geophysical Year, about which I'll say a bit more. But the environment was also a life world, in the sense of Karl Mervius. It was the Umwelt of Jakob von Luxkuhl that's perceived by the creature, not merely the physical surroundings. And the environment that emerged in the 1940s carried a certain sort of science with it. It was ecological and about systems. So Cambridge ecologist Arthur Tansley's uh, symbiotic combination of organic and inorganic worlds was a situated system 
that is both biology and physics, connected through physiology. Tansley, at least, was happy to include humans and the anthropomorphically changed world in his ecosystem concept, but his science was not morally responsible in the sense that most humanists would recognise. If you can't read the little bit in the middle, of that, the title of the paper that introduces the, the uh, word ecosystem into the literature is The Use and Abuse of Vegetative Vegetational Concepts and Terms. He was very cross with the American use of the term superorganism. <laughs> and so he, was a, he introduced this term system because he thought that would sort it all out. It didn't. In 1962, people started identifying as environmental scientists for the first time. The big science of the International Geophysical Year had created new opportunities for interdisciplinary conversations and the environment attracted scientific attention. In 1971, UNESCO launched another big science project, the Man and Biosphere Program, a programmatic approach to the environment which aimed to use science to improve relationships between people and their environments. I've put a little extra down the bottom there because Silent Spring was also 1962 very influential in some places and much less so in others. So pe people in Australia were not reading it in the 1960s, but uh, it was very, certainly important in the United States. Uh, <clears throat> now, in the United States, the environmentalists and their moral and political concerns about justice led historians into environmental history. Environmental was distinct from environmentalist in Australia perhaps because we had the first green political party in the world in Tasmania, running candidates in the 1972 elections. In Australia, justice and social movements focused on feminism and indigenous rights. And environmental philosophy was a great strength. So John Passmore, Peter Singer, Freya Matthews and Val Plumwood are all Australians. And I've put uh, The Fight for the Forests into the book in 1973 which is Val Routley is, is the same person. She changed her name to Val Plumwood because there were death threats after that book. Um, environmental history emerged rather later in Australia out of public history and environmental science. So we had scientists writing histories of ecosystems and they, they called themselves environmental historians. People writing about social movements called themselves political scientists. So they weren't like the American system at all. Public historian Tom Griffiths discovered environmental history in the United States literature as he was writing The Cultural Heritage of a Forest in 1989. He was the only historian in a team of heritage specialists, so I'm very pleased to see that Clue Plus includes heritage. Um, re reflecting on this much later, Tom wrote, environmental history was an instrument of heritage practice. It was a way in which public historians might talk to natural scientists and heritage practitioners across the nature-culture divide. Environmentalism was politics, environmental history was science, even up to two, early 2000s in Australia. The urge to be applied and useful to wider public concerns drove a new initiative in ecological humanities at the Australian National University. I should explain that in Australia, um, the sustainability that we all got in 1992 it was called sustainable development in most places. In Australia, it was called ecologically sustainable development. So ecological carried a little bit of sustainability about it. The Ecological Humanities Group was a loose partnership between anthropology, history, philosophy, cultural studies, and the history of science. And its events were often held at the Centre for Resource and Environmental Studies, now the Fenner School, where Deborah Rose and I worked with scientists and policy analysts. The rubber hits the road when we have a context for our discussion, as we discovered in our Environmental Ecological Humanities Initiative in Australia. I thought I'd just share a few slides with you, actually, rather than boring you with great details, but um, ideas from Environmental Humanities Initiatives beginning with the work of my own museum and looking at how we put the human into the Anthropocene. So this museum, which the, the, the orange loop is its signature, uh, opened in Canberra in 2001. It was a present to the nation for the centenary of Federation, and it is a history museum. But it was 
told that we had to do a section on the environment. So it was probably the first exhibition in the world where the environment was led by a team of historians, and I was one of those people. And we had to make people a subject of history, and the gap between science and, and people <coughs> was what we, we were working with. Uh, and the platypus exhibit was the first thing you saw as you went into the uh, exhibition. The idea of an animal that's warm-blooded that lays eggs. It's still weird today. So the platypus eggs. <coughs> Um, Jumping in water, the, the present, the, uh, the, these little pictures are from a film festival uh, that was held at the National Museum last week. Uh, they had an Anthropocene short film competition, and they're online and free if you want to have a look at them, the URL is there. Um, where I work in Stockholm, we had a Tales from Planet Earth film festival a couple of years ago, which was very well attended. And it was, a, it was an interesting festival because it ran first in Madison, Wisconsin, and then it ran with a slightly different suite of films six months later in Stockholm, and some of the same people crossed over between them. So it was, a, it was an international collaboration, as well as being a local event. So I guess what I'm trying to do is actually think with a museum, to take a museum as a way of thinking, rather than to think that you have to put stuff into a museum to think. So the whole museum is, is the thing you're thinking of. And the critical idea is this slow media. You go to a museum yourself. It's, it's, it's real. <coughs> there are virtual museums too, but I'm talking about a real one here. It's a personal visit. It's a place of conversation. And you quite often go with your grandparent or grandchild. So you have an intergenerational conversation in a museum that you don't have in other places. The objects are subjects. And I, I think it's just, it's, it's interesting to think with. We, we have a lot of fast media, and the media is getting faster all the time. What can we do to slow things down? The um, Haus de Kultur in, in Berlin, the Ethnographic Museum there, decided to have an Anthropocene campus in 2014, where they developed a whole lot of ideas through practical workshops. These ones were about um, graphic design, uh, but the idea was to uh, make a campus workbook that could be used by teachers teaching the Anthropocene in many different disciplines. Politically, it was incredibly important that, that museum, which has always been a museum of, of the primitive, if you like, of strange people from other places, and turning that around and making it about us. So the Anthropocene is about all the people of the world. And that was what House the Turn Develops brief was actually, but they had always done things on Bushmen and particular groups. The, the <coughs> politics of that was complicated. Museums are also places of performance, and this was a, a play run especially for us for our climate workshop in the Pacific. That Snoopy, if any of you are familiar with that particular cartoon, he got his kennel with the sea level rising, and um, it was a terrific performance. The other, one of the things that I found extremely useful, not just in museums but in teaching, is the idea of slamming the Anthropocene. Uh, a poetry slam is a, a competition between poets to see who likes their poems the best. It, it started in Chicago. I didn't know the term, but. The Madison people decided to have an Anthropocene slam, a cabinet of curiosities. Um, you had to bring along an object that represented the Anthropocene and sell it to people and say, this is the best way of, of uh, explaining the Anthropocene. So it would have to be a real object. Uh, you can do it in other ways, but we did it in museums. And this, this one with the man holding the microphone, he's actually um, explaining this particular artwork, which is uh, the Cape Farewell project about climate change. This is a, the, the art show people made the objects to, to sell the idea. <laughs> I actually like the ones with the objects that <coughs> found even more. They, you have to do more thinking with them. But uh, I've written about it. That paper's online if you're interested. Uh, Cameron Muir and I wrote about it. Slamming the Anthropocene, performing climate change in museums. Um, there have been some 
very interesting galleries of the Anthropocene, uh, and one big exhibition called Welcome to the Anthropocene, which is at the Deutsches Museum in, in Munich. It closed in September. Yeah. It just opened. It just finished. It just finished. Yeah. It's, it, it lasted longer than the 31st of January, which is what it was originally, but it, it's closed now. But it was, I think, a particularly interesting exhibition because it was a partnership between the museum and the Rachel Carson Centre. So it was a university plus the museum working together. And they uh, found all sorts of things happened. Like Nina Muller said, artists became scientists. Scientists became artists. People crossed over because of the practice of making, making the show. This is a, a coral reef crochet. <laughs> um, and the pull-out drawers had all sorts of weird <coughs> things. It was, a, it was gr great fun. The book exists, and it's in German and English, if you're uh, interested. But one of the challenges for museums in this time is that objects themselves are not so special. We've got too many. In the era of the uh, Bundekammer, the Cabinet of Curiosity, about 1600, the average European household had 30 objects. By 1900, that figure was 400. And in 2000, it was 12,000. And now we have people who are getting therapy because they, they can't get into half the rooms in their house. And the hoard, the hoarding has become a sort of a neurosis. So we have a problem. How do you make an object special? I think try have one of it is a good start. So the making the audience ordinary curious. So this was the object that won the uh, Madison, Wisconsin slam, slam and was transferred to the opening of the Welcome to the Anthropocene exhibition. And it's a handmade fossil of a Blackberry phone made in, in plastic by Jared Farmer, who is a <coughs> smart environmental historian, actually, but he, he makes fossils in his spare time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Greg Mitman looking at it. He was the guy who thought of the idea of the, of the slam. And carried it all the way to, to Germany. He's actually working with me at the moment in the Rachel Carson Centre. Mm -hmm. These are the, one or two people make the connection and then the rest happens locally. I think it's really interesting. So, I think, um, I'll just pick, pick over here. So, I want to talk a little bit about rewilding. I first learned about rewilding in Europe through a discussion funded by the UK Environmental Humanities Group at Wiccan Fen near Cambridge in 2012. This was the first time I'd heard positive things about wild horses. And the example they were talking about was from the Netherlands, near here at Ostfarkas Classes. <laughs> in Australia, they call <coughs> wild horses to save the hydrology and vegetation of alpine areas and also out in the deserts, where there are a million wild horses running hard hooves into precious water soaks. Rewilding is positive. Feral horses aren't negative. Though some associate wild horses with brumbies, which is another word we have for them. These are our grand cultural narratives, such as the man from Snowy River. I don't know if any of you know there's a film and major poem. So I've just thrown up a few books there. I, I can come back to them in discussion if you want. Um, but rewilding is something that Amsterdam is doing and the rest of the world is watching. So it strikes me as a very interesting possible project that could reach beyond for you to the wider community and practitioners. There's no right way to do this, it's new. But consultations and conversations open up opportunities to reflect on the practice to add humanities and communities to the management and planning, to ma maybe involve art as well as science, history, philosophy, as well as ecology and hydrology. And the other suggestion I have is even more open-ended. You live in a city of many of the finest museums in the world. Perhaps one or two of these might develop events or even exhibitions with your team. The same word, can mean different things in different cultural and historical contexts. 
one becomes increasingly suspicious of global theories of everywhere told in the limited present tense. Humanism needs to be as inclusive as possible, especially to include the people first affected by the slow violence of climate change, who really are the ones who benefited from the fossil fuel revolution which changed the climate of greenhouse gas. Big, complex environmental crises do not have easy solutions, and the way a problem is framed limits the possibilities for its solution. It's not the human species that's the problem. A species is incapable of responsibility. It has no capacity for self-reflection in a moral sense, as Chakrabarti argues. So the knowledge that our disciplinary silos has generated is all important, but far from sufficient. And we need ways to cross between the silos perhaps especially between the science and humanities, which I increasingly define by their practice, not by the formal degree of their practitioner. So some of our best humanists are reflective natural scientists. Not all the social scientists are concerned with the moral spectrum usually called humanism. It's, it's about the practice that defines the humanism. We also need ways to get beyond the ivory tower to tease out connections with the sort of knowledge associated with gut feelings or intuition. Getting beyond reason or reasoning in new ways is crucial here. The German uh, philosopher Susanna Lange has argued that art is the creation of forms symbolic of human feeling. Creativity is the expressive form of the imagination, the utmost conceptual power of humanity's organic existence and evolutionary developed values. The new humanities, especially the environmental humanities, offer us a great opportunity to work in partnerships with artists and museum publics, to think with objects, with collections, and to generate histories, not just of what happened, but of how the past is remembered and how the future is framed. There are many possible futures, and when the probable future looks grim, it's important to frame the future in other ways. Not to be unrealistically optimistic, but most importantly, not to deny hope or force inaction. For example, with respect to climate change, because some action might still improve the future. We may not be altogether able to save our grandchildren from our generation's inability to imagine their circumstances, but we ought to try. There's no one discipline that is expert on the moral future. It is, however, possible to note that many seem in practice to work in very short timelines. One week, three months, five years, rather than decades, centuries, millennia, which is clearly where the imagination is needed. The imagination is a powerful tool, and the urge to imagine the future is deeply human. It has a long past. Not to have a future is perhaps the most frightening thing about facing death. It is human to be anxious about uncertain futures. So I want to finish with hope and not anxiety. So I'm turning to a major Dutch public intellectual for the final word, as I wish the VU Centre for Environmental Humanities a great success in its future. And this is what Paul Crutzen said recently. There are many things that make me feel positive, most of all through the creative strength that can be found in art and literature we can understand the world better. Thank you.